Well, this is the Sportsline Podcast on CHCH for Tuesday, April the 9th. I'm Papa O'Neill. As you know, our focus, high-level athletes, coaches, executives, officials, and broadcasters that reside or were raised in Southern Ontario. Today, a football player that turned to the basketball court and proved that without risk, there will be no reward. Including the birthplace of this individual, there are seven lines of accomplishments on this board. And if we were to include every single achievement, contribution, good deed, and award of this individual, the graphics computer would go into overload. It would blow up, folks. Now, with that said, Burlington native Ron Foxcroft has always found a way to balance life as a businessman with fluke transport and the Fox 40 whistle. In addition to his passion for basketball, it led him to becoming the NC. NCAA's first and only Canadian basketball referee yet. He has gladly understood, accepted, and moved his role as a community ambassador. Folks, no one waves the flag of Hamilton Proud any higher. Mr. Ron Foxcroft, thank you so much for joining us on the Sportsline podcast, and I am honored that you're here. I'm more honored that I'm here, that I'm with you, <laughs> Baba, who I have known my entire life. Ever. Come on! I'm ever, not that old. <laughs> uh, no, ever since you were in high school, yep. and, and you had my son Steve, you work with Steve on, on a, uh, a television show on Sportsline, you won all kinds of awards, but today we got to get better ratings than we had when you had Steve on. <laughs> That's right. He was actually one of the first guys. In fact, he, he had to be. I, based on our history and some of the things we did, when I put together that first week of who I want to be my guest, and I believe he might have been number two, and, he's, and d- deservedly so after the years of uh, what we did on cable TV and the yeah. fun we had, and really confirmed my love for television and sports television. So you, you raised a pretty good one there. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, really that's did. right. Now, you know, Bubba, uh, you said uh, about me being the community ambassador. I'm really pounding my chest today. I just got back from the Final Four mm-hmm. in Phoenix, March Madness. Yeah. And I've never been so proud uh, to be a Hamiltonian as I am now. And I'll tell you why. Uh, they have a, uh, a festival at March Madness, just like the Grey Cup Festival. Sure. Now, the Hamilton Grey Cup Festival does not take a back seat. I am so proud of the city of Hamilton, the Hamilton Tiger Cats, for the Grey Cup Festival they put on in 2023. It does not take a back seat to what they put on in Phoenix at March Madness. And remember, in, in the NCAA, they have a billion dollar TV contract <laughs> they have 74,000 people at a basketball game they have money coming out of their truck mm. and and yet uh, we in Hamilton the city and the Tiger Cats put on the most amazing festival that was equal to or maybe better than the NCAA March Madness Festival that was just in Phoenix so I'm very proud to that you referred to me as the community ambassador mm-hmm. as far as all those achievements um i can't take credit for any of it no you should uh, no i can't and i'll tell you why uh the secret to business to life surround yourself with people smarter than you and and you know uh my greatest achievement right now my greatest thrill watching my three boys achieve i'm so proud of them uh, Steve, Dave, and Ronnie, my two grandkids. And, of course, when I was refereeing uh, four to five nights a week in the United States and we had fluke transport, I carried dimes, American <laughs> dimes, in my pocket mm-hmm. to call Marie, who was running fluke transport, <laughs> for at least the 10 years when I was on the road it seemed like every single day and you had to uh, call the office call the home is everything okay mm-hmm. are steve and dave behaving <laughs> and no uh, as is is steve being influenced uh negatively by his buddy bubba <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, we, 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 we balance each other off. I think that was part of the secret, though, yeah. to, to the little, whatever little success we had. But you know what? You got me there. You, you, you talk about those early days of you being an official, and I think that's something that we need to start off with. You being the, the first and, you know, really yeah. the, the decorated Canadian yeah. being on the NCAA court. And, and I know this was something and a passion that you'd had. Football didn't really work out for you. You played when, you know, we're watered down and... And, and you, you wanted to be a Hamilton Tiger Cat. That didn't work out. You yeah. had the back injury, whatever. But you go to officiating, <laughs> right? Now, okay, we all are in this area and, th and think, okay, you know what? If I study and I work hard, I could be in what I guess was the OUA or the CIS, or what it was called at the time. But sometimes you, you, you took that chance. You somehow landed an opportunity to do Olympics and then the NCAA. Yeah. That, that, like at that time, it's like high pressure NCAA. How did that all work out? It was really different. And and no, I grew up. Uh, I didn't want to go to the OUA or the CIAU. I was going to be the quarterback of the Hamilton Tiger Cats. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I loved the Hamilton Tiger Cats. Grew up. I met my dad. Introduced me to Jim Trimbo, who lived mm -hmm. over in Aldershot. And so I grew up wanting to be the quarterback because. Right to this day, my favorite sport is Canadian football, CFL. Uh, my business is basketball, which I love. But no, what happened, uh, and you know, this is sometimes you have to turn adversity into opportunity. I was playing quarterback at Waterdown High School prior to getting expelled from Waterdown High School. <laughs> Nicole Martin, <laughs> she became the valedictorian. That's right. Famous. That's right. At Vic uh, I got expelled. <laughs> now, 50 years to the day, uh, the principal asked me to speak at Waterdown High School, and I did. 50 years to the day that I got expelled, and she introduced me as a famous graduate. Mm -hmm. Time out, Michelle Visca, principal, famous attendee. <laughs> Bubba, I want you to know that, that the principal, Michelle Visca, gave me 50 years after I got expelled my high school graduation diploma. Wow. Not an honorary. The deal. I graduated from high school. Anyway, played for football. We had a good football team and got hurt and uh, turned to officiating. Uh, I didn't do hockey, <laughs> didn't do football, because I don't like cold weather. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I did basketball, met Kitch McPherson, and uh, everybody needs a mentor. You know, two things. You need to surround yourself mm -hmm. with smart people, and you need a mentor mm -hmm. or two. And I'm sure you've had an amazing broadcasting career, and I'm sure that you can attribute that to somebody that's Absolutely. been a mentor somebody's a somebody's yeah. so uh i met frank buchanan got me into officiating met with kitsch and uh kitsch was amazing and all of a sudden at 21 years of age i'm doing the ciau now u sport mm -hmm. final and i did it with lenny parisi i'll never forget it and he's and i was scared to death when lenny turned a mentor Lenny turned to me uh, as they're playing the national anthem, and he said, uh, Ron, you do the running and I'll do the talking. <laughs> and I loved before a game the national anthem. And uh, when I went to the States, of course, they would make quite a, an honorable production. But anyway, uh, lo and behold, uh, Going back, my first game was a CYO game, and Tom Gallagher paid me 75 cents and said, we want change because you're rotten. Once again, adversity, mm -hmm. adversity to opportunity. He was right. I was rotten. And I decided that I'm not the smartest guy on the planet or in the neighborhood, but I can be the hardest working guy. Mm -hmm. That's the secret. You don't have to be the smartest guy in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. You have to be the hardest working guy. And I worked hard and uh, got a call when I was 30 years old to go to the Olympics. Mm -hmm. Went to the Olympics and it was the Olympics after the screw up in right. 1972 when the Americans won the silver. 
So Yugoslavia, Russia, was it? Yeah, Russia. Uh, Russia. Or US. Soviet Union. Yeah, and the United States to this day have never accepted their silver medal. Anyway, mm -hmm. I got there, and the guy running the Olympics, his name was Lord Kalana, and said, uh, well, you're Canadians. You're a Canadian. Canadians can't play this very well, and we don't think you can referee very well, but you're going to get one game. And I said, that's one more game at the Olympics than anybody else is going to get. And I went out there and refereed like crazy. Got two, got three, got 11, got the gold medal game. Mm -hmm. Gold medal game, my whistle with the P got stuck. There you go. <laughs> when Adrian Dantley took an elbow in the nose. But uh, I guess I got through that game because the NCAA hired me. Well, they came and they said, uh, would you like to referee in the NCAA? And I said, where do I apply? They say, you don't. Mm -hmm. You're hired. And I went to the uh, NCAA, but Bubba, uh, I really never shared this with anybody. It was kind of tough in the beginning mm -hmm. because all the people that I had refereed with had come up with the coaches through Division Three, Division Two, Junior College. Well, I'm this Canadian that got parachuted in and the coaches didn't know me Don't from know Division 3, Division 2 and many of them would say to my partner uh, who is this Canadian that has been parachuted in and why isn't he refereeing the violent slippery surface game hockey mm -hmm. so it was really tough and I realized, too, that I had a lot to learn. But things worked out. I did a game in Houston. There was 18,000 people, and, and um, it was a tough game. But I still wasn't accepted. But we had a good game. And it was in the summit, the famous arena. Mm -hmm. And my partner, at the end of the game, uh, he, he came in and he said, you know, I was really not happy about working with you because <laughs> my buddies have been not getting an opportunity that you've taken away being a Canadian. Being a Canadian. He said, but you aren't Ron the Canadian, you're Ron the ref. Back then, there was no cell phones, no social media. The way to uh, communicate was uh, telephone and tell a ref. <laughs> and I guess he shared it that I was a little more than Ron the Canadian, I was Ron the ref. Things started to get better, the assignments got better, and uh, did a lot of conference championships, went on to the Sweet 16, and um, really had a wonderful time, my 25 years. I just absolutely, it was hard. You know, uh, I had a real job. The only uh, referee that crossed the border yeah, because you're game. running the truck company too. Well, Marie, yeah. Marie, my wife was running the trucking company, and I was carrying dimes in my po American dimes in my pocket, so I could call They're her. Worth a dollar here, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and I would I would call her, and of course Steve and Dave were very very young at the time, and and so that was all that was really really hard. Uh, but looking back, that journey, that journey. It was absolutely amazing, and and I learned a lot. You know, sure you I I got a doctorate in life, mm -hmm. <laughs> and and how you can overcome adversity and turn it into opportunity, and how there's never such a thing as a a a bad call if you turn it around as a learning experience. Mm -hmm. So I had my share of bad calls. Uh, in particular, I missed my first ESPN game national. I missed a goaltending in triple overtime. And um, to this day, I still have dreams mm -hmm. <laughs> about missing. Did you, did you miss it? I missed it. Yeah, okay. I missed it. Yeah. And I called my supervisor, distraught, and he said, well, you know, as long as you turn that into a learning experience, we're going to be okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll, I'll never forget him saying that. But even to this day, it bothers me. The coach who the call went against, I met in the parking lot laying on my trunk <laughs> <laughs> and wouldn't let me in the rental car until I explained that call. Mm -hmm. 
As it turned out, my next game, that was a Saturday on ESPN, the next game was Monday night, the same coach. Mm -hmm. And uh, what he did to get me in trouble, he secretly went to the game ball and let the air out of the game ball. And uh, when I went out to ch toss the ball up, there was no air in the ball. <laughs> And he reported me as not doing my pre-game oh, wow. duties. Anyway, um, a few years later, he was still coaching, <laughs> and uh, you again. I, I went to his. I went to him, and um, you know, before the game, you go and shake hands with the coach. And I'll never forget. He almost fainted when he saw me, but I went right over and I, coach. What a pleasure to work your game. <laughs> it it took, took him uh, by surprise. Let, let, let me, there's so much we can go. I mean, yeah. I know we only have so much time, yeah. but like, there's, yeah. there's so much in my mind here. First of all, quickly on this one. I don't think I've ever asked Dave this question. Yeah. I've never asked Steve this question. So you will be the first person I ever ask, at least especially the first official referee. What is it like when you're in an arena, pressure situation, Fans are on edge. Yeah. Especially when you're doing some big time college games with the bigger schools and the bigger conferences. And they're all, ref, you suck. Ref, you suck. And it's 18, 17,000, 20,000 in unison. Do you hear that? Absolutely not. I was immune to that. Mm -hmm. And you know, the one secret about officiating, and I, I shared this with my sons. I never wanted to force my kids into officiating. They made their own decision. And um, all three of my kids are in officiating. Steve has achieved. I'm so proud of my kids. Steve, Dave, uh, doing his first uh, Grey Cup, I was more nervous with him, watching him, than I was refereeing the Olympics in the same stadium. He did his first great cup at the Montreal Olympic Stadium. The same with Ronnie. Now, Ronnie said to me, I never go out and tell the coaches my last name. <laughs> <laughs> That's his his secret. I'm, I'm really, really proud of the achievements of my kids. Did I hear that? Never. Never. Because Kitsch taught me during the game, there must be 110% focus on your job, on your responsibility. You have a privilege mm -hmm. of refereeing that game. And part of that privilege is you have to concentrate and there can be nothing else in your life. And I've been uh, abused, <laughs> criticized. <laughs> I got to tell you the, the one... Uh, and John Calipari, you know, has just oh, left Kentucky. Yes, uh, big news. Uh, he became a very good friend because I, I called his first ever technical foul on him mm -hmm. at UMass mm -hmm. when he had Camby. But I remember him coming to me. We were at St. Bonaventure. He was number one in the nation, mm -hmm. UMass with Camby, going into St. Bonaventure. And, um, and, and, um, St. Bonaventure weren't even ranked, mm -hmm. and he and and uh, Calipari came up to me and he says, "You know, Ron, my daughter's favorite referee in the NCAA is you." <laughs> <laughs> and he's working me, <laughs> <laughs> and I make the call mm -hmm. that puts the game into overtime. Now here's an unranked team, place is jammed. Mm -hmm unranked team against the number one team in the nation. If you're the one, number one team in the nation, everybody's there. ESPN's there. The major networks are there. CNN are there. <laughs> and I made the call that put the game into overtime to which Calipari came down to me and he says, my daughter's not going to like you. And, <laughs> <laughs> and John's done well. And, and we met at the, at the Final Four. And he was explaining to me the pressure of being the Kentucky coach. Mm -hmm. If they lose one game, it doesn't have to be in the tournament. People are looking for a tall bridge to jump off of That's right. or a tall building if the bridge doesn't work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there's a lot of pressure. Sure, there is. The it's NCAA big and right. there's... A lot of television money. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, uh, answer your question direct. Nope. 
I never heard. I worked in Kentucky with 22,000 fans, worked everywhere around the country. I worked in six conferences. Never heard the crowd. All right, let me raise the stakes then. Yeah. You spent a lot of time on the basketball court with someone. Now, Mr. Calipari can blow his top. I've seen it. Yeah. But there's someone else that's more famous for blowing their top. Maybe even throwing chairs on across the <laughs> across the <laughs> the hardwood. And you know where I'm going with this. Yeah. The dude in Indiana, yeah. Bobby Knight. Yeah. A guy that was probably more popular than the governor. Yeah. And you tossed him out. I did. I did. You tossed him out. Yeah. Bobby and I were pretty close. <laughs> when he was the Olympic coach, he called me mm -hmm. and he said, you know, Ron, these Americans, they don't understand FIBA rules. I want you to travel with my Olympic team. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had a great tour. They, they would uh, go across America with his Olympic team playing the NBA All-Stars. Right. And that's where I met people like Bill Walton, who was playing for the uh, NBA All-Stars. They were terrific. And this Olympic team, and everywhere we went, we had this wonderful tour. There was one time, uh, uh, this is a great story, in Iowa. Mm -hmm. Bobby was not liked in Iowa. And um, the place is jammed, and the fans hated Iowa. And so uh, I went over to Bobby to uh, tell him something, and he started waving his arms and pretending he was screaming at me, <laughs> which the fans, of course, went nuts mm -hmm. because they didn't like Bobby. They Actually, they liked me. Okay. <laughs> and what he was saying is, um, uh, let's go back to the airport together. <laughs> <laughs> That's what he was saying. Uh, okay. Anyway, uh, I, I worked that tour. It was a wonderful tour. And, and, so, and then he went on to the Olympics and so on. So a few years later, I'm working a Russian game in Bloomington. And the Russians and the Americans are like the Russians then and the Canadians in hockey. Mm -hmm. uh, and they were pretty good. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a contract to work all the international tours with uh, that went across playing big time schools because I had the right passport. Mm -hmm. I was a Canadian. so. Even Stephen, I'm I'm neutral, yep. but trained in the United States, mm -hmm. so I did all those tours, and uh, so we go into Bloomington. I took my wife, Bobby Knight was worshipped, and um, so he's getting whacked in this game. <laughs> Isaiah had uh, graduated, mm -hmm. and so uh, he's he's on me. And he's down about 15 points and came to me, and he says, you're going to have to throw me out of this game. <laughs> and I said, under all circumstances, Coach, I'm not throwing you out <laughs> because I know what the headline's going to be. Referees screw Indiana. <laughs> so the ball went out of bounds. Back then, he was allowed three technical fouls. Ball went out of bounds. It was an obvious call. And uh, he yelled, you suck. <laughs> so I bust him. The same thing, the ball went out of bounds, obvious call, you suck. And he came and he said. Like straight to your face. Yeah. And he said, you're going to throw me out. <laughs> and I said, listen, you're getting whacked. And if I have to stay to the end, you're staying to the end. And he said, Canadians can't play this game and Canadians can't referee it. And I tossed it. <laughs> That's it. Well, in Bloomington, Indiana, I have just tossed God. And uh, so we went into the locker room and the police said, we've got a real problem. We got to get you back to Indianapolis. And the bigger problem, your wife is up there and it was a very serious situation it took marie about two hours with the police to get down to our locker room to get our car and a police escort really back. yeah yeah uh, that was uh, quite an experience um and and marie kind of sided with uh 
Bobby Knight. <laughs> Mar- Marie played on that famous, you know, Hamilton's a hotbed for women's basketball. Yep. But Marie played on that famous Bishop Ryan team uh, that won 159 straight games without wow. a loss and three offices. And, of course, you know, now you've got Transway, you've got Cathedral, uh, won three offices, you got St. Mary's. But Marie's team was, you know, her sister, Teresa, mm-hmm. went on to play for the Olympic mm-hmm. team. So, but Marie doesn't like referees. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and uh, so she, she kind of thought that um, I didn't treat Bobby fairly. <laughs> well, you caused a lot of hassle yeah, for her too, yeah, right? Yeah, but, but we got the police escort. But, you know, with my kids, I didn't want to force them into officiating. My son, Steve, I got to tell you how he got into officiating. I took him to a game in Florida. I had to toss one of the coaches. His name was Torchy Clark. Mm -hmm. And um, we had a police escort, Steve and I, out of the arena. Uh, We were in the police car, two motorcycles in front, two motorcycles behind, took us to the hotel, which was next door to Denny's. (laughs) Steve, we got into Denny's and said, you know, this refereeing business is fantastic. We get a police escort, two motorcycles there, two motorcycles there. I'm getting into officiating. Mm-hmm. This is a great business. Mm-hmm. Dave, he, um, he's refereeing basketball, really good. Mm-hmm. But everywhere he went, he said, they would say, you only got this assignment because your name's Foxcroft. So he turned That's to tough. football, yeah. did all those gray cups. Ronnie got in, and what he does, he says, Dad, I never tell anybody my last name. Mm -hmm. I just go out and I referee. And, of course, he's a great golfer, and he's a student sommelier, and my kids are great. I got two adult grandkids who are amazing, so... uh, and I surround myself with the team smarter than me. Well, it, it all comes full circle, and and then that's the amazing part of it is that. And, and I think that's one of the things I've always admired about you is that one, you've never forgotten these lessons. You've never forgotten where you've come from. Right. You, 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 as I said, and I, I I'll say this a, a thousand times. You wave, you wave that Hamilton flag as high and as proud as anyone. And I think that's one of the things that people. I mean, it's it's, it's a, probably the oper- why you met the Queen and all these things of the honor of Canada. Like I people take notice to this stuff that you've done because you could have easily been successful with the book and the whistle and the trucking company and just stayed and enjoyed all the things that you've accomplished (laughs) in your home but you're out there and that's why you're a hall of famer and i think that's one of the, the amazing things that you know people look at you and associate you with Hamilton. They associate you with basketball, which I know you're very, very proud about. And you're still doing stuff in in, in basketball now. You want to let people know because I don't think I think here's yeah. here's something that I've told. I think I said this on the podcast with Steve. Yeah. Is I get this all the time. I'm watching the Raptor game, <laughs> and I I'm looking at the referee. The referee's doing some kind of replay stuff. He's checking some. I'm getting annoyed because the referee's taking too long looking at that replay. But then I noticed that is that Steve Foxcroft, <laughs> and that is that Ron Foxcroft. Yes. Well, well let, let people know what you do at the at the Raptor games in the NBA level. I retired as a basketball referee. Mm-hmm. And spent a year taking up skiing. (laughs) And I went three times down the hill and turned to Marie and I said, Marie, we've just bought a ski chalet. We just bought a membership and we just bought $14,000 worth of equipment. I hate skiing. (laughs) So Stu Jackson called me. Stu, okay. From the NBA. And he said, "Uh, we've got a new observers program. Mm -hmm. And are you interested? And I said, Stu, I haven't been home on a Saturday night in 25 years. Marie will kill me. (laughs) I'll find you a person. Mm -hmm. So I went home and I said, Marie, she loves Stu Jackson. Mm -hmm. I said, Stu just called and um, offered me a job as an NBA observer going to all these games and observing and critiquing and evaluating and I turned him down because uh you know I haven't been home on a Saturday night and you know she was taking me to birthday parties and wine and cheese parties and skiing I hated it and and you know what she said she said you haven't refereed for one year 
You're driving me stark raving mad. <laughs> You've been a complete idiot <laughs> since you stopped refereeing. You miss refereeing. You miss the locker room. Call Stu on his cell mm -hmm. and accept that game. Mm -hmm. uh, Bubba, that's 22 years ago. I've been working for the NBA first as an observer. Now mm -hmm. um, I, I do the uh, courtside administration. Mm -hmm. we, d we do the coaches' challenges, the replays. We're in, in uh, uh, communication with the uh, replay center. And uh, three years ago, uh, it got to be quite arduous. The gridlock going to Toronto right and uh, I called the NBA and I said listen my son Steve is enormously qualified I mean he's done about eight CIAU championships games he's done FIBA he's he's done NCAA we were the first father-son right. to work you did your last game yes yeah. yes exactly we did our last game together my son mm -hmm. Steve and uh They've allowed us to share the job, so we job share the mm -hmm. job. Is oh, just love it so much. And thank goodness Marie said I was a pain in the butt uh, and uh, driving her stark raving mad mm -hmm. the year I took off and didn't officiate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let, you know, and again, that's I think that's great that you're so close to the game, and of course, it's your love, right? And and, yes. and I guess Marie had to find out the hard way, but <laughs> you know, I know you, you talk about being at the NCAA, at NCAA Final Four and just coming back and, and, and what you saw, and you know, Zach Eady unfortunately didn't, you know, it's just, it, Purdue just didn't have the numbers. You call no. us a super team. Let's, let's just be honest with that. Right. But I'm going to say this. I watched that tournament, and I kind of had a feeling. I watched enough pa college basketball to have a feeling that UConn weren't going to get beat. But I had questions in the, about the women's tournament. Whoa. And the women's tournament, I will say, and I know I'm not the only one, storylines all over the place. Yep. South Carolina, 38. Could they go 38 and 0? Right. This Caitlin Clark, Paige Becker's a Canadian, oh. right? Right. I mean, Aaliyah yeah. Welly, uh, sorry, Aaliyah Will uh, Edwards from uh, from Kingston, UConn, yeah. uh, their head coach, uh, Gino. Uh, it just so many storylines, and the tournament delivered right down to the final game. Oh. Two parts of this question here. What happened to women's basketball that at least this tournament was better than the men's tournament? Like, what happened? Like, what's why is it bigger? The ratings, I mean, we haven't got the ratings because we it's we're still less than 24 hours from the final, right? The men's final, but I don't think it's going to beat the women's final. Uh, no, the women's final, uh, well, first of all, the Yukon Iowa game. 14 million viewers. And That's, 19 in the final. And 19 in the final. Now, that outdrew NBA. That outdrew MLB. Now, I understand, except for the football national championship game, it outdrew college football. Outdrew the final round of the Masters. Never has the Masters gotten that number. Exactly. Now, uh, a couple of things in particular. Caitlin Clark. Um, North America relates to Caitlin Clark because... She was shooting threes from the logo, from the center court logo, from everywhere. She was shooting threes from Burlington. <laughs> I, I, I mean, it was, and, and you know what, why people related to her? She has not done anything wrong. There's been nothing in social media. She's just been the all-American lady, and she's not a giant. And that's why also people can relate to her. The other thing, that South Carolina team, they— uh, they taught us you have to go nine deep mm -hmm. as a team you know it's one thing to have five starters and caitlin clark it's another thing to have nine deep mm -hmm. that can all play all get minutes and and all score plus the coach for south carolina mm -hmm. i mean she's on the same stratosphere as caitlin clark mm -hmm. don staley yeah an amazing human being and that's important an amazing coach more amazing as a human being. And I think America related to that. The games were just, and Gino at yeah. UConn, Gino, uh, I, I, I mean, he is amazing. He's won so many national championships. But, you know, the call that went against him. In the semifinal, yep. I like the way he handled it. Uh, he, he said, 
Uh, and remember, he coached Nia uh, 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 Nurse, Kia, Kia Nurse. Nurse. Yep. I, I, I mean, you know, Stewart. who's bigger than Kia Nurse in Canada? Not too many people. Well, and not for basketball. Not for basketball. Right. That's right. So, but you know what he said? Class. There's no substitute for class. Win with class, lose with class. Mm -hmm. And all he said was, our players need to make better screens. That illegal screen. Which reminded me, you know, there's a foul on every play, Bubba. There's a foul on every play. Just like there's a holding on every play. Yeah, well, every yeah, football. except Randy Ambrosi said, <laughs> offensive linemen never hold. <laughs> <laughs> and Randy's my golf partner. And, 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 but, you know, I got to tell you, a similar story we had with UConn in the Sweet 16 when I was officiating. UConn and Washington. Mm -hmm. Todd McCullough, Canadian, played for Washington. Richard Hamilton, famous guy. Mm -hmm. And we had, and Tim Ryan, Canadian, on did the, the broadcast on CBS. We had four seconds to go. Washington's up 84-83. TV timeout. The crew huddled. I was with Don Rutledge, one of the best officiating officials on the planet. And we huddled during that TV timeout and said, the only time we're going to let the players decide this game, the only way we're going to blow a foul or blow a Fox 40 whistle is if there's an assault mm -hmm. and the player that gets fouled, assaulted, has to be air ambulance to St. Joe's Hospital mm -hmm. in Hamilton, Ontario. <laughs> Thank God we were prepared. You know, you always have to raise your concentration level in the last two minutes of every game mm -hmm. because the call you miss early won't make the headlines on CHCH uh, sports <laughs> uh, with Bubba O'Neill. <laughs> the call you make in the last two minutes if it's incorrect is going to hit Bubba O'Neill on CHCH channel. I'm going to rip you. Yeah. <laughs> so we said we know the ball's going to Richard Hamilton. And if he's assaulted, we'll call it. Well, Richard got the ball with four seconds to go down one and went in, shot, missed, got a layup. Todd McCullough marginally fouled him. It was a foul. We passed. That was the right thing to do. The ball went in. And UConn won went on to the Elite Eight, went on to the national championship, won the national championship. And that's how timing, how close they were to not winning the national championship. And, you know, Bubba, uh, the controversy, if I had a called the foul on Todd McCullough, he's Canadian. Can you imagine? Oh, I the, would be sitting linkage. today probably yeah. in Woodland Cemetery. <laughs> so... You know, the game, yeah, that, that screen, that illegal screen, uh, by rule was a foul. By rule was a foul. And uh, I, um, I, I got to support the referees. Uh, they, they made the call. Uh, I don't know if I'd make the call. I don't, I, I don't know. Do you think the coaches understand that, that ultimately you don't want to influence the end of a game? They do. Yeah. The coaches understand because Gino, that had to hurt. Did he? The guy dropped to his knees. Yeah, that really. But I'll tell you, don't you admire the way he handled it? Yeah, for sure. I mean, here you are, right after the game in the heat of the battle, you got the media with a microphone in your face. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't it be easy to rant? Yep. And um, say what you're really thinking. And he didn't. And I have so much admiration and respect for him, Don Staley, uh, uh, Caitlin Clark, the entire uh, women's basketball has been elevated into another stratosphere. I'm so happy because really and truly in Canada, Hamilton is the hotbed. There's no question. It's not even debatable for women's basketball going back to Ancaster, uh, Candy Clarkson, to Bishop Bryan, Marie Grant, Foxcroft, uh, 
and then St. Mary's with Coach Waslowski, mm -hmm. uh, obviously uh, with uh, Cathedral mm -hmm. and Transway. Teresa oh, Mack. Teresa, uh, the national championship, Teresa Burns and Dougie Harrison, who we lost. Uh, it's it, There's no question. I, I am thrilled. And, yes, it, it outdrew everything. I, I believe the number was 18 or 19 million yep. viewers. That's that's See. in another stratosphere. Yeah. It really but is. It, but, it, but it wasn't like... It wasn't like it. It was. Oh, I have to see this because it's a girl, a women's sports. No, it, it was intriguing. It was. It was intriguing it, it, and fun it, to watch, and yeah. and like the, the 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 back and forth. And can I say this too? Like the game to me, the women's game seems to be more exciting because I feel like with the guys' game, it's okay. Get down the court, look around, jack up a three. Right. Like you know, you right. see it inside out, outside in, ball movement. Yeah. All of it. You're right, and drama. Which would bring the drama because the games are so close. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The talent level <laughs> is really in it. Now, remember, um, back in the day of Pat Summit at Tennessee, they had runs. Remember Old Dominion? Mm -hmm. uh, Critelli, Chris Critelli. Mm -hmm. Chris Critelli, uh, and they're a sponsor on Critelli Furniture, mm -hmm. are a sponsor on CH. But Chris Critelli uh, won a national championship in Canada and went to Old Dominion and won a national championship. Only human being. And she's from Canada to win a national championship in Canada and in the United States in the NCAA. I mean, we got to be very, very proud. That's you. You've dovetailed to exactly where I need to be right now. <laughs> let me let me set this up. In my opinion, I could be wrong here in the NC in, in the NBA, the yeah. favorites to win NBA MVP Hamilton Shea Gilgis Alexander um, Giannis Atembakupo yep Greek Nigerian yep um, Jokic Dokic okay there's just four guys just right there or five guys right I look at N. Naismith player of the year men's player Edie Zach Edie I think of the possible rookie of the year in the NBA. Yes, France. Victor Wembleyama. From France. I haven't said an American player. No. What happened? The world has caught up. See, I did the 76 Olympic game, and it was all college players from the United States, and they competed around the world. And that's the lesson. You know, uh, there's nothing wrong with growing your talent base and playing somebody better than you. What mm -hmm. what makes you better? Playing against somebody better than you as a learning experience. And that's what's happened. The entire world have caught up. Now add Jamal Murray in there. Yes. And RJ Barrett. And just think of all these great Canadians and all these great players that and and you know, we gotta thank the Americans because back in seventy six with Phil Ford and Adrian Dantley they were college players, Bubba, and and they were playing against adult men. And these college players were beating these adult men. And so the way to get better is to surround yourself with people that are better than you mm -hmm. and learn and create that learning, create that opportunity. And that's what's happened in the world. The world basketball has caught up to the United States, and it's made the game extremely more exciting. It, and I, the example is the kid from France yeah. going with the Spurs. Oh, this gonna, kid can he, do anything. He's, he's seven gonna, foot four. He's going to be the best player in, in the NBA in, yeah. in a very short time. Yeah. Now, the other thing, too, <clears throat> remember, I, I came up in the days of um, Bird and Magic. I refereed Magic at, at uh, Michigan State, and he was Irvin Johnson then. And Larry Bird at Indiana State. Remember, the NBA wasn't the NBA that we know today. They were on tape delay. They didn't have the big People contracts. Forget that. Uh, to be honest with you, I had a chance to go to the NBA, but I was making more money in the NCAA because they had a better TV contract. That all changed with Bird and Magic. And I remember sitting in the bus going from Cincinnati to Kentucky with Irvin Johnson at 18 years of age. And he was uh, disappointed that he wasn't starting for the United States Olympic team. Mm -hmm. Well, that all changed. <laughs> it, uh, it became Magic Johnson. Mm -hmm. But the game is 
amazing, the talent level. Now, the reason, too, remember, the college game is so exciting because you have the fans that are 20 years old, you have the bands, <laughs> you have players. Wild atmosphere. You have players playing 30 games a year, uh, not not 110. Mm -hmm. You have players playing a 40-minute game. Uh, I'd, I'd like to see fewer TV timeouts in the NBA game in a 40-minute game. I love the FIBA game where you take the ball off the rim. And I would love to see a 40-minute game because – to play 110 games from preseason to playoffs is tough physically and tough mentally. That's okay. not going to change. It, it, it won't come back, though, right? Like, no. we, we've already gone there. Like, I mean, yeah. I think about, like, I mean, hockey, that's a big discussion, too, that playing 82 games in the NBA, the players are saying that's why load management is, is what is being used because you know, we're not playing 82 games, yeah. and the health and all that kind of stuff. Now, and give you're right. the NBA credit that. Yeah timeout they used to have under 10 yeah uh, they canceled that now it's under seven well, that's good so you know, you we, know the tv timeouts are two minutes and 45 seconds which is a long time well we see that with baseball right baseball understood right. that we needed to change right the pitch clock these games are being clocked at like 2 30 and mean and, and in our lifetime we were watching games that were three hours and ten minutes and yeah I mean and then it's a Yankee and, and uh, Yankees and Red Sox and those games were like almost four hours long yeah. it's just too long yeah. the um, the only thing I want to talk about is the price of the tickets now for the average fan for the family yeah um, I just um, went to the uh, Phoenix Suns game the tickets are priced properly so you can uh, take your family it was a, a really different audience. Mm -hmm. There were kids there, six, seven, eight years old, real fans right. in the lower bowl because they could, the family could afford the tickets. I, I really think, uh, and I talked to Glenn Grunwald about this at the Final Four, when are we going to reach the point that, uh, you know, a $1,000 night, well, you couldn't, you couldn't go to an NBA game in Canada for a $1,000 night with a family. Uh, so I think that we really need to look at, you know, uh, uh, when the Blue Jays came to town, uh, it was the greatest time when I could take my kids with a $2 ticket and buy a 50-cent Coke. Yep. So I am concerned. But going to the Phoenix game, the whole lower bowl was families because uh, they were the tickets were priced mm -hmm. so a family could attend. And we got to get... I don't know if we're ever going to get back to that. Well, you think about the NBA, I mean, our, the, NBA, the Raptors in particular, what happened to the Sprite family zone? It's disappeared. That, like it, that's right. Like it's gone, right? And, and you're right. And I know there's player salaries to be considered and all of that kind of stuff. That's just reality yeah. of all sports. But, yeah, you're right. I know we had Gareth Wheeler on here on the show here not yes. all that long ago. And, you know, he's a big soccer guy. And he said that was one of his biggest complaints about the NHL and the NBA is unlike soccer, yes. soccer always provides supporter zones right so the the blue collar hardcore fan yeah the guys that bleed the team right there's a section for them and That's they're right. generally the loudest and the most rowdiest yeah hence we get the singing in sports and you, when you listen to those games in england and we don't have that here and no. it's been forgotten and to the point where you know there is a discussion where have the real fans have have the real fans been forgotten in sports in major North American sports? Let's put in a plug mm -hmm. that the affordable sport right now mm -hmm. in Canada is Canadian football. These kids play for the love of the game. They're not their their salaries in the Canadian Football League are not in another stratosphere that's mm -hmm. beyond what you and I can count. Mm -hmm. The Canadian football is still the sport in Canada where you can take a family and enjoy some popcorn and a hot dog and some Coke and, and, and not break the bank. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm, I'm a big CFL guy and, mm -hmm. you know, my son Dave is referee. By the way, Dave is named after Dave Keon because <laughs> I was at the last Toronto Maple Leaf Stanley Cup victory. And Dave Keon was the, the most valuable player. Yeah. That was a long time ago, Bubba. <laughs> and I named Dave yeah. after uh, Dave Keon. 
Yeah, I think you just hurt some Leaf fans with I that did. one, right? You just you yeah. just hurt a couple of. I'm not one, but oh, I mean oh, that was a gut punch. Yeah, that that yeah. was a gut punch for yeah. some, for, yeah. for for some That's Leaf right. fans because it's been a long time. That that parade, they're still waiting there. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> you know I mean? exactly right. You know, we could go. All, I mean, first of all, will you come back? Will you come back? It would be such a pleasure, Bubba. Mm -hmm. I have known you since you were in grade nine. <laughs> You've accomplished so much. And um, I, I'll be honest, I was so excited mm -hmm. to come in and share this time mm -hmm. with you, who I love. And uh, please have me back. Yeah, I, 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 yeah. Thank you very much, first of all. Um, and I return the, everything that I said off the top there. I mean, and I, and that's just not my. The, I, I wrote those words, but those are words I write because that's the feeling I get from you. That's a feeling I get from people in the community. Um, people, you've made. Hamilton's in a big renaissance right now, and you think you know that, and you talk about the Grey Cup and, and yeah. the Grey Cup Parade and Festival, and that a lot of people point to you for, for someone that are, that's making this city a better place and a place uh, where people want to live and people want to work and uh, and to wave that Hamilton proud and, you know, and then, like, to say, hey, we love our city uh, and we appreciate all that you've done and the fact that your name is forward in, in when you say Hamilton, a lot of people say at uh, the Foxcroft so well yeah. you know Hamilton are the most aggressively friendly people but also mm -hmm. the most aggressively generous people mm -hmm. and uh, we have things like uh, City Kids and Liberty for Youth and all the money mm -hmm. from that book mm -hmm. goes to City Kids and Liberty for Youth so I hope people on this podcast go on to fox40shop.com mm -hmm. and buy that book. Mm -hmm. It's a pretty good book. Right. Wrote it with Michael Ulmer. Mm -hmm. Hey, Ulmer. Uh, yeah, and and um, and knowing where the money goes. Mm -hmm. City Kids and Liberty for Youth. Hamilton is wonderful. But, you know, when I refereed, I would say to people, I'm from Hamilton, Ontario. Mm -hmm. The first thing they would say to me is, that's where the Tiger Cats are. That's right. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, that's where Ron Foxcroft is. You bet. Thank you so much. We look forward to you joining again. There's so many stories we could go on and on. But Thank you, you Bubba. It at least gives me one more episode on this network. <laughs> <laughs> My pleasure. <laughs> Thank you very much. Hey, that's our Sportsline podcast for the day. And as you've just seen and heard, we love talking to these people that love sports, that are passionate sports, and are passionate about their community. If you do know of an athlete, team, or event to promote, the Sportsline podcast do want to hear from you. Please hit that thumbs up, like, and subscribe button. And if you do have something to say, good or bad please comment because we do appreciate you listening and you letting us know how you feel for the wonderful people that make the sports line podcast possible thank you so very much and we'll see you tomorrow